This episode of Money for the Rest of Us is sponsored by Peer Street, an online platform for investing in real estate back loans. Peer Street provides investors unprecedented access to an asset class previously not open to them, hard money lending. I've built out a diversified portfolio of loans throughout the country backed by single family homes. Historical returns for Peer Street have been in the 7 to 12 percent range, terms generally 12 to 24 months. You can get more information on Peer Street at PeerStreet.com. Welcome to Money for the Rest of the Personal Finance Show on money, how it works, how to invest it, and how to live without worrying about it. I'm your host, David Stein, and today is episode 142. It's titled, Why Are Some Countries Richer Than Others? The pro and I were walking home from dinner the other night in the city of Merida on the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. It was around 7 p.m., and we came upon some laborers working on the walls inside the courtyard of a school. We'd passed them earlier on the way to the restaurant, and I noticed that they just didn't seem to be wrapping up their work for the day. I asked one of the workers, how long do you work each day? From 8 in the morning until 8 in the evening, he said. Every day? He clarified it wasn't every day. He gets Sunday off. He showed me a piece of decoration he was hanging on the school. It was a stone relief carving of plants and fruit. It's pure rock, he said. We work on the stone in the factory for much of the day and then hang it later in the afternoon in places like this school. Now, if you spend much time in Mexico, you'll notice people work a lot. Many work in the informal economy. They're selling flowers, newspapers, and backpacks on the street corners. Others, like these construction workers, are in the more formal employment, and they toil away well into the evening. I I was surprised there was a a tall building they were building in Merida, and you had workers. It was getting dark, and they were still way up high on this building working. According to the OECD, the average annual hours worked per year per worker in Mexico is 2,246. That includes both full-time and part-time employment. In the U.S., the average annual hours worked per year per worker is only 1,790, and the weighted average across 36 nations within the OECD is around 1,766 hours. Now, the OECD suggests caution in comparing one country to another because of different data sets used to calculate it, but at face value, it appears Mexican employees work longer hours than any other OECD country. But even though Mexican workers work more, they actually earn less. Earlier that week, LaPro and I drove into the town of Beckel in Campeche, and the mission was to buy a hat. I wanted a new fishing hat made out of straw that they weave in this particular town and have done for a couple hundred years. As we turned around the square, we had two boys, teenagers essentially, on bicycles approach us and and actually almost started arguing, trying to get them to go to a particular shop because they weave these hats in caves in the back of houses. They they build a cave in their backyard so so that there's a little more moisture so that the, the little prawn leaves that they use to or the to to weave the hats to stay moist enough and so I we followed one and I got to know the kid as we were talking and he was to hit later took me to an ATM and he was studying engineering in school and and I thought you know that's a great profession in Mexico that's that's really the way to to, to get ahead so that you don't have to spend your days weaving hats if you don't want to and then I looked at what do engineers in Mexico earn? And according to Mexico's Observatorio Laboral, a petroleum engineer in Mexico earns about $12,000 per year, while an accountant earns only $6,000 per year. Now, petroleum engineers in the U.S. earn upwards of $100,000 a year, while the median accountant annual salary is around $67,000. So professional salaries in the U.S. can be roughly 10 times higher than Mexico. But living expenses in the U.S. aren't 10 times higher than, than you find in Mexico. According to, according to the website Numbeo, 
consumer prices in the U.S. are only about two and a half times higher than Mexico. And when I compared prices where I live in Idaho to this town of Merida in the Yucatan, prices in Idaho are not even twice as high as Mexico. They're about 86% higher. Now, some prices in Mexico are the same as the U.S. Gasoline. You might have heard of just the frustration of many Mexicans as the government raised gas prices, which had been controlled. They want to go to market rates, and that caused a jump in gasoline prices of around 20%. Now, we've not seen any, at least in the Yucatan, there, there really haven't been any protests. But that, that, you can understand the reason why. If, if you make much, much less than about a tenth of what your U.S. Part, U.S. friend makes in the, or somebody in the U.S. makes versus Mexico, and you're making about a tenth, and yet you're paying the same amount for gas and how gas and other commodities are in the inputs, it would cause some frustration. So Mexicans are much poorer than Americans. They get paid less, and their salaries don't buy as much. Now, that probably doesn't come as a surprise, but the question is, whenever I travel down here, is yes, why? Why is it that Mexico and other countries aren't as wealthy as the United States? And that's the focus on today's episode. Now, the most common measure for comparing wealth between nations is per capita gross domestic product, or GDP. GDP measures the value of a nation's output in terms of goods produced and services rendered. So GDP per capita measures the value of that output per person. Government statisticians estimate GDP by calculating the value of goods and services purchased in a country during a given period, let's say a year, or they look at the amount of income earned by households and businesses within a country during a given period. So you can look at, they estimate the the value of this output, and they can estimate it by what was bought, and they can estimate it by the amount of income earned. Now that makes sense because every dollar or peso spent on goods and services within the U.S. or Mexico is someone else's income. I spend a dollar, somebody else gets that dollar as income. Per capita GDP in Mexico is $9,510. That compares to the U.S., which is about $51,638. Now, that's a little misleading because at current exchange rate, a dollar goes much further in Mexico in terms of what you could buy with it than you could buy with that same dollar in the U.S. And so we need to adjust the exchange rate, come up with an exchange rate that's called purchasing power parity. And what that does, it looks at, it essentially it backs into an exchange rate based on what it would take to purchase a basket of goods and services in Mexico. How many pesos would it take to do that compared to the number of dollars it would take to buy that same basket of goods and services in U.S.? And so that's called purchasing power parity. And so we can look at what GDP is per capita using a purchasing power parity exchange rate. And by that measure, the GDP per capita in Mexico is $18,865. And in the U.S., it's $57,294. And so what that means is that Mexican workers earn less than their U.S. counterparts because each Mexican worker produces less goods and services per hour worked. If you have a lower GDP per capita, per person, then that, that's the value being created by workers. And if we, we calculate that to what they're making per hour, they, they produce a lot less per hour. They're much less efficient. And so because they're less efficient, they earn less than those in the U.S. Now, again, why is that? Why do Mexicans produce less or other poor nations produce less per person that contributes to the gross domestic product and ultimately translate into how much they can earn in terms of income. Why is that? Economic models typically separate the components that contribute to economic growth into three broad categories. This is called growth accounting. And the three categories are capital, capital, 
labor, and something economists call total factor productivity. Physical capital is the amount of investment in infrastructure, such as buildings, roads, and equipment. An economy grows as companies and the government make capital investments in new infrastructure and equipment that facilitates the production of more goods and services. So that's one component, the physical capital. Labor reflects the contributions of workers to economic growth. So an economy grows as workers become more educated and skilled and when more workers enter the workforce, allowing for a greater production of goods and services. So that's capital. We've talked about labor. The third is total factor productivity, and that measures the efficiency in which labor and capital is deployed to produce goods and services. It also measures the impact of new technology on production, including how quickly new ideas are adopted and spread throughout the economy so businesses can utilize them. Now, I read this week a fascinating paper that I'll link to in the show notes, and it was by Charles I. Jones, and you can also get this paper if you had signed up for my insider's guide. I will have sent you all the links, show notes to this week's episode, as well as a summary article. You can sign up for that at moneyfortherestofus.net, or if you're a U.S.-based listener, go ahead and text the word INSIDER to the number 44222. So this paper was called The Facts of Economic Growth. And Charles Jones came out in 2015. He surveyed all the decades worth of studies on economic growth and, and, and really sort of answering the question, what drives economic growth within a current country? And why is economic growth and wealth different from one country to the next? And he found that the primary reason that the differences of wealth in terms of the economic wealth from one country to another, a rich country and a poor country, was this total factor productivity. And in the paper, he has lots of tables. So he shows one, he shows the Mexico's per capita output per worker was about a third of that of the U.S. So this is the what a worker produces in one hour. And then he sort of broke that down and he looked at capital. And they found that the the ratio of capital to output was about the same as U.S. So given Mexico's level of GDP and and the the level of U.S., the amount of capital deployed to create that output was about the same in terms of the ratio. And so that wasn't really the determinant. In terms of labor, Mexico obviously has a lower level of education for its average worker. And that, that was a factor it explained about a third of the difference in GDP per capita between the two countries. For example, a study by Robert Barrow and John Wong Lee called A New Data Set for Educational Attainment in the World came out in 2013. They found in 2010, people aged 15 and over in Mexico had about 8.8 years of education compared to 13.2 in the U.S. And so more educated workers can be more efficient. They can handle the technology easier, and so companies can deploy technology. And so that contributes to the output and explains about a third of the difference between the U.S. and Mexico wealth. Wealth, But total factor productivity explains 60% of the difference between Mexico's per-person economic output compared to the U.S. Jones writes, Development accounting tells us that poor countries have low levels of inputs, but they also are remarkably inefficient at how they use those inputs. And so now we're going to look at, well, why? What is it about Mexico that they are less efficient at producing in terms of their productivity? Before I explore that, let me share some words from our sponsors. Back in the mid to late 90s, I was not smart enough to buy one-word domain names like money.com. And that's one reason money for the rest of us is a six-word domain name. But I was smart enough to buy the domain names for my kids. So I own all my kids' domains, and I own lapril.com, for example. And why? Because sometimes or someday they might want to start their own business. All those domains are registered at GoDaddy. And GoDaddy's mission is to radically shift, as they say, the global economy toward life-fulfilling independent ventures. And they give people the tools they need in order to succeed. In other words, to start lifestyle businesses. They have more than 62 million domain names under management. And if you have a business idea or a project idea, register the domain. 
you can do that. You can get 30% off on a domain name by using the code David30 at checkout at GoDaddy.com. So GoDaddy.com, David30, get 30% off a domain name. A few weeks ago, I introduced a new sponsor to the show. It's Wonder Capital. They offer an online investment platform that allows individuals to invest in solar energy projects across the U.S. I've invested in some of their funds, which allow you to earn up to 8.5% annually while diversifying your portfolio, curbing pollution, and combating global climate change. Why did I invest? Well, what impressed me about them, there is such a demand to install solar plant panels by mid-size, small mid-sized businesses, but they don't have access to the capital. And as a result, they go to Wonder Capital, and Wonder Capital is able to choose who they want to work with. They approve only about 5% of those that apply to get loans. And as a result, as these businesses repay their loans to Wonder, you receive monthly payments directly deposited into your bank account. You can open up a free account at wondercapital.com slash David. That's wonder with a U, W-U-N-D-E-R, capital.com slash David. So we're looking at why poor countries are so much less efficient in terms of producing their total factor productivity compared to rich countries. Part of it is due to institutional constraints in terms of just the sheer level of corruption. How much red tape is there to start a business? The rule of law, do you, can you get title to your property? The efficiency and fairness of the judicial system, access to public health services, and the quality of the educational system. Those things matter when we look at one country compared to the other. Sometimes it's geography, but often not. Now, obviously, a country that has oil is going to be a little better off if they can take advantage of that. But Mexico has a huge surplus of oil, and still they're a very, very poor country. And one example in the Jones paper, he compared North Korea to, to South Korea. They, South Korea, they both sort of started in the 50s coming out of the Korean War, but very, very institu- different institutions in terms of the government, in terms of the type of economy. And there's a huge gap between South Korea and North Korea in terms of their wealth. Now, also the inefficiencies arise due to cultural constraints in terms of the allocation of worker talent. Are the people, is there discrimination? Are women and minorities able to pursue their talents and get into specific professions? There was a study by Eric Hurst, Charles Jones, and Peter Klenow. It's called The Allocation of Talent and U.S. Economic Growth. It came out in 2013. They found in 1960, 94% of doctors and lawyers were white men. By 2008, this fraction was just 62%. And they say, given that innate talent for these and other highly skilled professions is unlikely to differ across groups, in other words, women should be just as likely to be doctors as men, as African Americans and white women were able to take advantage uh, of these occupations, that actually contributed to economic growth. The paper quantifies the macroeconomic consequences of the remarkable convergence in the occupational distribution between 1960 and 2008. And they find that 15 to 20 percent of growth in aggregate output per worker is explained by the improved allocation of talent. So a country where everybody has the opportunity to pursue what they're good at in terms of their occupation is going to be more efficient and will have more wealth because the economy will grow faster. Other things that have an impact is just the use of technology. The, The ability to, for example, in Mexico, still 13% of workers work in agriculture, farming. It's only 2% in the U.S. And as economies transition over time, it's, they start out very much focused on agriculture, and then it, there becomes much more manufacturing. And now it's services. And why is that? And this is probably the most important insight that I got in preparing for this episode. It's that the mix of the economy changes over time. 
And one reason the U.S. is wealthier than Mexico and other developing countries is the mix of the economy has changed to be much more service-oriented. It's not that manufacturing went away. It's just that the U.S. is much more efficient with its manufacturing. Now, certainly certain jobs have gone away overseas, but it's not as if manufacturing went away. If you look at the U.S. economy in 1967, manufacturing made up, this is of gross domestic products, so the value of the output, manufacturing contributed $217 billion. And so it was about 25% of gross domestic products. So manufacturing comprised roughly, it was about an eight, let me make sure I do this right, the math right. So $800 billion economy in terms of GDP. 25% of that was manufacturing. In 2015, manufacturing was 10 times more, $2.2 trillion. That's a huge increase, but it was only 12% of gross domestic product. So it's gone from 25% down to 12%, even though it's 10 times larger. It's much more efficient. But there's only so many goods you can produce. What has taken the place of manufacturing in the U.S.? A big change has been finance and insurance. It went from $32 billion in 1967 to $1.3 trillion in 2015, growing from 3.8% of gross domestic product to 7.2%. Real estate is another one went from $86 billion to $2.4 trillion, from 10% of the economy to 13.1%. Professional scientific and business services went from $41 billion to $2.2 trillion, so from 4.7% to 12.2%. And finally, healthcare and social assistance went from $23 billion in 1967 to $1.3 trillion in 2017, so from 2.6% to 7.2%. Why the, the, the switch to services? Because it's not as if manufacturing isn't being done, but services, higher value services, take a larger part of the economy. And part of it is just as we get more stuff, what we want is more time to enjoy our stuff in our high level of consumption. And so health care services become important. Things that will help us to live longer become a larger part of the economy. Now, this is such an important point. If we look at the inauguration speech of President Trump, he says, we must protect our borders from the ravages of other countries making our products, stealing our companies, and destroying our jobs. Protection will lead to great prosperity and strength. America will start winning again, winning like never before. We will bring back our jobs. We will bring back our borders. We will bring back our wealth, and we will bring back our dreams. We'll follow two simple rules, buy American and hire American. After listening to that speech, I went back and listened to episode 104, Is It Possible to Win at Trade? And I would encourage you to listen to that episode. I'm sure I'm going to do another episode on trade here. But this idea of bringing back manufacturing jobs, one of the questions is, what are we willing to pay for stuff that is manufactured in the U.S.? If we bring back, because so much uh, of manufacturing is, is very, very automated now and becoming more automated, what's not automated is moving to countries like Mexico where the workers are paid $5 an hour to work in a factory. Do we want to pay more? Are we willing to pay more for goods in order to take advantage of that. We had a, a great example of this. We decided, did Lapril and I, for our daughter's birthday, we wanted to buy her a shirt, a custom-made blouse because it, it, it would fit perfect and she could choose the fabric. And we looked locally, who, who could make this for us? We found one person in the entire eastern Idaho located in Teton Valley in Drix, a, a seamstress that can take a pattern, adopt it, fit it, to our daughter and make it. It took her 12 hours of work. She charges $40 an hour for this skill, highly sought after skill. The shirt, we got a bill, I was shocked. $565 for a shirt. And and we'll pay it. We'll buy another one because it was so expensive. Now we compared it. I mentioned going to Beckel in Campeche. I wanted to buy a hat. 
I bought a hat. They ranked the hats from one to five. One being the the cheapest, and so it takes less time, and so the the weave is not as tight. To five being the most expensive with the tightest weave. I usually buy second best, so I bought a four, and I didn't negotiate. I don't negotiate in Mexico. I said, "What? What is it?" He says, it, "Essentially, it was eighty dollars." It took him an entire week. That's about two dollars an hour to make a shirt. Had I paid, had, the, had that, uh, not a shirt, the hat, had the hat been made in the U.S. at $40 an hour, would have been about a $1,600 hat or an $800 hat. We've got used to paying much, much less. And if we're bringing manufacturing, it's got to be extremely efficient and automated. And the manufacturing that remains in the U.S. is, is that type. And so that, that's just one of the things that we're going we're gonna to struggle with. So as Mexico, the way that they're going to become in other poor countries that could be wealthier is they're going to find that they're gonna, their, their industries are going to have to be more automated. The institutions are going to have to be more streamlined. And, and ultimately, they're probably going to more from less in agriculture, more in eventually more in services because That's where the highest value added. And one of the other things I didn't really talk about in the paper is when you think about an accountant or an attorney that works for Facebook versus an accountant or attorney that works for a clothing manufacturer, they're going to make more at Facebook. In other words, higher income businesses, higher margin businesses, more service-based businesses. If you're in a particular, if you're an engineer, or an account, you're going to make more because everybody else is making more. And so our, in the U.S., the GDP per capita is, is much higher because the education level is higher. The level of productivity is, is much, much higher. But more important, the mix has changed to areas of the economy in terms of the cost of goods and services that demand higher prices, higher value added. And so the mix has changed. We're not going back. So the mix is not going to go back to an economy that's 25% manufacturing. It's just not going to happen because we don't need that much stuff. And we're in a competitive world. I lived in Mexico during the 80s when they closed the borders. The only brand you could buy of any electronic was Philips. And, and it was frustrating trying to buy electronics there. Now Mexico's competing. They have free trade agreements, and they're willing to compete, and their wealth is growing, but they have a long way to go, and they're going to continue to grow and grow and grow, and, and hopefully that'll benefit all the people there. I want to end with an important principle regarding the economy that was brought to my attention. Remind, I was reminded by a essay written by Bruno Giussani, European Director and Global Curator for TED. It was in Edge magazine. Next week, I'm going to talk a little bit more about these essays I found in in Edge. It's an online magazine. He writes, it's not clear whether it was rice or wheat. We're also not sure the origin of the story, for there are many versions, but it goes something like this. A king was presented with a beautiful game of chess by its inventor. So pleased was the king that he asked the inventor to name his own reward. The inventor modestly asked for some rice or wheat. The exact quantity would be calculated through the simple formula. Put a grain on the first square, two on the second, four on the third, and so on, doubling the number of grains until the 64th and last square. The king readily agreed before realizing that he had been deceived. By mid-chessboard, his castle was barely big enough to contain the grains, and just the first square of the other half would again double that. Giussani goes on to say, The story has been used by anyone from the 13th century Islamic scholars to scientific author Carl Sagan to social media videographers to explain the power of exponential sequences, where things begin small very small, but then once they start growing, they grow faster and faster. To paraphrase Ernest Hemingway, they grow slowly, then suddenly. This idea of exponential and its ramifications ought to be better known and understood by everyone. And he calls it the second half of the chessboard. And it was a notion put forward by Ray Kurzweil in the 1999 book, The Age of Spiritual Machines. 
where he suggests that while exponentiality is significant in the first half of the board, it is crazy when we approach the second half, and that's impacts become massive, things get crazy, acceleration starts. And that's where we are in our economy, the second half of the chessboard. When we see the advances in smartphones, language translation, blockchain, big analytics, self-driving cars, artificial intelligence, robotics to sensors from solar cells to biotech ge- genomics or genomics, neuroscience, and more. The economy is radically unpredictable. And we don't know where it's going to, to come. And we can't manage it from the top down and beat up individual companies for their action. It's got to be bottom up. We have to have appropriate legislation and regulation. But we, it's got to be bottom up, driven within the constraints to the, the realistic constraints and realistic regulation. But we are in the second half of, of the chessboard. Fascinating to see how the economy will continue to develop, how the weights will change over time in this completely unpredictable economy. That's this week's episode. You get show notes at moneyfortherestofus.net. Everything I've shared with you in this episode has been for general education only. I've not considered your specific risk profile. I've not provided investment advice, simply general education on money, investing in the economy. Have a great week.